Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 4th, 2012, and my guest is Chris Anderson, editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. His latest book is Makers, the New Industrial Revolution. Chris, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks. Always great to be here, Russ. We're going to talk about your new book, Makers, and the essence of this book is that desktop or maybe tabletop manufacturing has the potential to change manufacturing the way desktop publishing has changed the printing and publishing business. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly it's certainly that sort of democratization trend that's driving it. I mean, I think of it as more than just desktop publishing. That certainly is a good analogy, but this this is potentially bigger. I mean, the personal computer put the word personal in front of an existing technology, which previously been industrial and mainframe and kind of democratized it and you know gave it gave us all that powerful tool um, then the web did the same thing for communications and publishing and broadcast and and now you know a series of not just desktop you know manufacturing tools like 3d printers and, and, and such but also um, uh, design tools um, you know sort of analogous to the desktop publishing software is is CAD software that now is cheap and easy and you know and widespread and and then finally the notion of cloud manufacturing um, in the same way that you know the cloud has given us all access to you know you know industrial grade computing facilities thank you google um you know the industrial grade manufacturing is equally a, a click away so those three things together um you know add up to a democratization of manufacturing that it could have i think you know potentially bigger effects than than the computing uh, democratization did so talk about what that technology is like uh, for a, a maker, someone who wants to fabricate something in their own house, because I think most of us, not most of us, almost all of us still think of do-it-yourself manufacturing or home manufacturing as something you do in your garage. Maybe you've got a bandsaw or a table saw, or you're doing some kind of you know, maybe a home project. But you're talking about a world, it, it has a science fiction aspect to it, but it's here. It's now. Yeah. Well, the, the big change in the last five years is that tinkering, which was, you know, which was traditionally exactly as you say, you know, bandsaws and garages and such, has become digital. Um, and it's become digital in, in, in two important ways. You know, one is that, um, you know, a set of, of um, industrial technologies called rapid prototyping technologies, 3D printing, CNC machines. 3D printing is a way to kind of add material and build up a structure, you know, a, a physical object layer by layer. CNC machines are called subtractive technology, and they use a, a grinder to, you know, a computer-controlled machine to cut away materials, leaving a physical object. And then things like laser cutting. Um, which 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 cuts 2D objects. Those things, which were have been in industry for decades, have suddenly become affordable and easy to use for consumers. So you can you can buy one now for a thousand or two thousand dollars, and they're easy to use. My children have one. A lot of schools are starting to get one. So that's a little bit like you know what happened with a laser printer in 1985. That a um, you know previously industrial you know professional printing technology um, became desktop and personal, and and you know anybody could do it. Um, the second thing is that these, um, you know, the, the design tools, the software that you use to, to, to design things that can be output on these devices. Uh, it's called computer-aided design or CAD. Uh, traditionally, these have been extremely expensive professional tools like, you know, AutoCAD and, and others cost $6,000 a seat, take, you know, years of training to learn. Now they're free and on the web. You can go to sites like Tinkercad, it's just in your browser and, um, you know, and use it on any computer and it looks like a game almost. It looks like, you know, Minecraft or some other, uh, some other, you know, easy, easy design game. And yet it, it you know, at the core, it's a sophisticated CAD tool. So this is basically, you know, lowering the barrier to entry to, to, to designing the things. Um, and then, you know, and so that, that those two things have become digital ideas rather than being sketched on paper and now being uh, starting on screen. And then once they're on screen, they can easily be fabricated, turned, you know, made real without any particular machine skills or, or even particular, you know, fancy, fancy tools, just with a, a box that looks like this, looks like a, you know, somewhere between a toaster and a microwave oven that you can buy. Um, now and just plug in like your own inkjet printer. 
and out of it will quite magically come a physical object that you invented. Yeah, let's talk about those. And before we do, I just want to mention a number of listeners have noticed that they've heard me typing in the background as I'm uh, interviewing my guests and have presumed that I'm sending emails to my wife or writing my next uh, blog post. I- I'm just taking notes on the podcast, folks. Uh, for example, I'm taking notes of links I want to add or what my next question is. So don't be alarmed. I'm Chris. I am paying attention to you. If you hear the, the clicking of keys, <laughs> I didn't notice. Not to worry. Um, Let's talk about this technology in a little more detail because the only time I've seen anything like it is the time I was in a design shop, which has, you know, a massive tens of thousands of dollars version of these things that would take up uh, the size of a maybe half a bedroom. These are much smaller, but what do you get out of them? In my mind, when you say a, a 3D printer, do I just get like a, a cardboard? thing that comes out of this that's been layered up or you know it's like a clay model that you'd think of when you think of someone designing a car that they've sculpted out of out of clay or something like that but it's not so talk about what comes out of it what's what's the output yeah, well, so the, uh, you know, it depends on which kind you get. Um, the one I'm looking at right now is, um, we have a, a series of maker bots. Um, and a maker bot is, um, costs about, um, I think now it costs about uh, $2,100. Um, they come, there's smaller ones like the 3D Systems Cube, which costs us about, uh, about $1,200. All of that class of 3D printer, which are sort of somewhere between toaster and, and microwave oven side, um, output a, um, basically plastic, um, ABS plastic or another kind of starch-based material called PLA, which is, I think, based on corn. It's biodegradable. But at any rate, it feels like plastic. Um, and it, um, you know, it, it, it tends to be one or two colors, uh, depending on which machine you have. And um, although it's quite good quality, if you look very closely, you can see, you can see lines in it. It's, um, it's not, doesn't have a, a, you know, a, a polished surface because it's actually built up in layers. Um, and um, and that, you know, but that plastic, you know, once you bring it out, it's basically it's a prototyping tool. So sometimes what you want is in fact the plastic. So my children, for example, use their MakerBot to make dollhouse furniture and uh, which they download designs from a site called Thingiverse for free. And then they print out the dollhouse furniture and they paint it. Um, my boys, um, they'll, um, you know, print out uh, Warhammer figures for their board gaming. Uh, my friends print out, um, you know, um, little jewelry items or maybe prototypes of jewelry items. And, and in, in those cases, they're pretty happy with the, the plastic, either because they actually want the ultimate device, the ultimate product to be plastic, or because it's, it's good enough as a prototyping tool. What's cool, though, is that that very same file that you designed on the web or, or, or with free software, you can upload it to services like Shapeways, and it can be printed in anything, um, you know, stainless steel, silver, titanium, glasses, you know, resins of all sorts. Um, you can make, you know, really beautiful um, jewelry or, or, you know, or mechanical gears, things like that. A friend of mine is doing an entire silverware set, all 3D printed and uploaded to, to, to Shapeways. So the, the, the home technology tends to be plastic, but the same design file sent to a Surface Bureau on the web, you know, with a point and click experience can be produced in, in any substance. And so that silverware, for example, two questions, the, the device that, that, you're accessing via software when you order, say, the silverware. What does that cost? First of all, what's the capital investment? And then secondly, uh, what does the silverware end up costing you? So obviously yeah, they're related. So, so Shapeways, the company, has those big industrial machines that, that you were talking about before, the ones that cost you know, $80,000. Um, but you don't care about that because because all you know is that the silverware costs forty dollars. Yeah, you're renting it. Yeah, you're renting it exactly. You, actually, it, it's it's a combination of the time and the materials. It's actually you charge on a kind of cubic inch um, basis. So it's really about the volume the, the, for re, two reasons. One is that the that the raw materials have a certain cost, and the other is that is that uh, 3D printers tend to be relatively slow, and so the time spent the time it spends to print something is relative to the amount of material it has to lay down. And when I say slow, I mean, I mean on the order of 20 minutes, you know, to print something. So is that 20 minutes per fork? Uh, yeah, 20 minutes per fork um, is, is about right. Again, it sort of depends on the material. Sometimes there's, there's, there's multiple layers. They'll print out one material and then, and then put it through a, um, a heating process to, uh, to melt it and so it flows properly. It really depends on the, on the material. So this is pretty cool. Uh, it allows you to 
you know, design your own silverware, and that's that's lovely. I'm not interested in that personally. My wife might be, but I'm not. Uh, so other than that kind of, or make my own dollhouse furniture. I don't have a dollhouse. My kids don't either. Other than that kind of what you might think of as a novelty application, it's fun to make your own stuff. It's fun to choose. There's a little bit of customization here. What's the potential for this that's, um, that makes it uh, possible for you to think of it as a third industrial revolution, which is what how you describe well, it? Yeah, you, you ju- we've just been talking about one of a whole class of, of uh, you know, desktop or digital manufacturing tools. Um, in fact, you know, we don't use any of these tools. And our, I, have a, I have a company. Um, as, as a matter of fact, uh, you introduced me as the editor of Wired, and, but today is, in fact, my last day. As the editor of Wired, I am uh, I am uh, leaving to become uh, CEO of my robotics company, 3D Robotics. We make drones, and um, you know we use all these. You know, th- three years ago, I was a dad messing around with my kids um, with you know with you know Lego and other kind of you know gadgetry, Arduino, and things like that. And um, now we have uh, you know quite a big multi-million dollar robotics company with two factories, all because. These tools were available to us. I knew nothing about manufacturing. I knew nothing about robotics. I knew nothing about drones. I knew nothing about electronics. Um, but in three years, we've managed to build, you know, you know, two factories, big pick and place lines. You know, basically state the art electronics, making, you know, competing with China simply because this stuff has become so accessible that even I could do it. Well, I need to. So in our case, I need to take a second yeah. here and, and first of all, I'd make a note to myself to sell my uh, stock in Wired magazine. Now that I know you're leaving, although it's probably not inside information. So. So it's probably already in the price of the stock, and of course there isn't uh, where it is now. It's on stock, privately, but, privately held. But I'm, 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 I'm slightly alarmed and and I'm disappointed, but I'm excited for you. Why don't you tell that full story though of how uh, fooling around with your uh, kids and trying to be a geeky dad, you ended up um, starting a company? That's I mean, as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, yeah, well, he's the editor of Wired. What's always interested in this toy? That's nice. And all of a sudden, you get a factory. So talk about yeah. that. That's how that happened. Well, you know, I, I got to say that the, I didn't set out to write the book, and it certainly isn't an act of journalism. I, I set out to, you know, to do cool things with my kids, and it kind of spiraled wildly out of control. Um, basically, um, I'm always looking, I, you know, years ago, I started a site called Geek Dad, which is all about looking for, you know, science and technology projects to do with your kids that are fun for you and for them, as opposed to just one, which is the usual. And um, in the course of, and by the way, I've consistently failed. I have five children from uh, four to 15, and consistently Consistently failed to get them interested in science and technology, but I, I'm, I'm not giving up. And um, about and almost five years ago, um, we were given a Lego Mindstorms um, kit. And Lego Mindstorms is their kind of Lego robotics kit, um, and uh, you know came into the office for review. And there was also a radio control airplane um, which came into the office for review. And I thought this is going to be awesome. On Saturday we'll build a robot. On Sunday we'll fly a plane. You know, something. One of these two things is going to interest the kids. So we uh, on Saturday we we uh, you know sat down and opened the kit and they liked Lego um, and they put together the robot as, as instructed and it's a little three wheel rover thing and you know programmed it and you know after a full morning's work turned it on and it rolls forward until it sees the wall and then backs away and the kids just sort of stared at me and they're like you've got to be kidding <laughs> you know I've seen Transformers <laughs> that's not a robot you know where are the lasers where are the rockets why isn't it three stories tall. You know, so Hollywood and CG have basically ruined robotics for children. So that's, that's, it's hard to compete with that. So that was, that was a disappointment. And then the next day we took the airplane out in the field and I crashed into a tree. And, you know, and then if that weren't humiliating enough, I then climbed up to retrieve it. Um, so, th- so, you know, b- b- basically it's a geek dad failure. And, you know, I, I had bribed them with ice cream to, you know, to ever make them go out with me again. And, um, I was thinking about how that weekend had gone so badly wrong. You know, the robotics wasn't cool enough and I sucked at flying the plane. I thought, you know, what would be a cooler use of robotics would be to fly the plane better than me. And I was thinking about that, you know, the, the, the sensors that came in that Lego kit, there's a gyro sensor. These are basically, you know, just little plastic bricks, but inside them are chips, a uh, gyro sensor, a gyroscope, an accelerometer, which measures gravity, a, um, a compass sensor, Bluetooth, which could connect to GPS, uh, an arm processor, like in a, a cell phone. 
And I realized that, you know, basically those were the essential elements of an autopilot that could fly a plane. So we, I brought them all together and got the kids together for one last little go. And we, we kind of constructed a Lego autopilot and we put it in, in the plane and it, um, it kind of flew. And um, today that uh, Lego drone or Lego unmanned aerial vehicle is actually in the Lego Museum in Billund, Denmark as the world's first UAV. And the kids lost interest like 10 minutes later and I went right down the rabbit hole. And just sort of said, well, that's, if I can do this, you know, there's something fascinating going on here. And although I didn't realize it at the time, what I'd stumbled on was the fact that the smartphone revolution is not just a revolution of smartphones, but also in all the components that go into smartphones. And inside your iPhone or Android are all those things I was talking about, you know, tiny MEMS sensors. MEMS stands for microelectronic electronic mechanical devices, but basically sensors like gyros and accelerometers and compasses that used to be mechanical and cost tens of thousands of dollars and, you know, way, way, you know, tens of pounds are now all integrated into tiny little chips that you can buy for a few dollars. And, you know, what's, what the Moore's law is accelerating at a pace that we've never seen in history before inside smartphones with the, um, the processors themselves, which are basically supercomputers, um, what's going on with the cameras, uh, GPS, wireless memory, all that kind of stuff. All those components you know, which, which are exciting enough inside your pocket are even more exciting out when you think of applications outside of the smartphones. And robotics is one of them. And I just happened to stumble onto this at the very moment that those components were becoming available on the, uh, on the open market. Um, so that led to a journey of discovery, um, a, uh, a website, a commu- uh, you know, a social, uh, community called DIYdrones.com where, where we all started sort of, you know, collectively figuring this stuff out. Um, then a company um, to make these called 3D Robotics. And um, today uh, we have uh, two factories, one in San Diego, one in Tijuana, about 45 employees. Um, I just raised a $5 million venture capital round. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we, put, we put more drones in the air every year than the entire U.S. military fleet. And, you know, and this is like literally four and a half years after playing around with Lego with my children. Now, if it's a great story, um, if it had happened 50 years ago or 30 years ago, a person, and, and you talk about this in the book, you know, you have an idea, you're uh, an inventor, but that next leap from inventor to entrepreneur 50 years ago, 30 years ago was very difficult. What t- people typically did was license their idea or their prototype to a large factory that would produce them. And that's not what you did. So give us some of the steps of how this maker revolution, this desktop revolution uh, interfaced with your desire to make better drones that would be powered by robots. Yeah, exactly. Well, so as, as you say, you know, the old model was that, you know, you could invent, but you couldn't manufacture if you didn't own a factory. And, and it was pretty hard to own a factory. Um, so you had to patent and license. Um, in our model, what we, what we did is we basically, um, you know, much as the web lowered the barrier to entry to, well, much as, much as computing and, and the web loaded the barrier entry to, to software, to computation, to communication, to broadcast, et cetera. And that, you know, with YouTube, we're all basically competing with the television studios. Um, you know, this, this similar technologies have made it easier to manufacture. So in our case, what we did is we, we had, um, we do electronics by and large and autopilot is basically electronics. And, um, uh, we started with something called Arduino, which is an open um, hardware processing board. Um, it's basically a little computer that interfaces really easily with the outside world, sensors and servos and actuators and things like that. Um, it's called physical computing. Um, this is this used to be really hard, and Arduino made it easy. Um, and the board costs like thirty bucks, and you know you basically can make things work in the real world by 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 writing programs. Um, so th- so we built on the Arduino platform, which meant a lot of the hard work of basic electronics was already done. Um, as I say, those, um, those components that have completely enabled what we do are now available to anybody. You can buy them at Radio Shack. Um, we buy them from, you know, electronics um, distributors, but those distributors who used to only serve, you know, other companies that B2B service are now, now have consumer sides as well. Um, B2B, as the sort of, you know, the electronic hobbyist movement is taking off. B2B meaning business to business. 
business to business. Now they now they're B to C, um, and business to consumer. And then and then finally, you know, getting something like a printed circuit board made. I mean, you used to have to, you know, get, you know, actually get, you know, uh, you know, etch away copper with acid, and it was a horrible thing. Now you go to services online, and you just sort of, you know, you, you download free software that designs that you sort of design your circuit board, and simply a matter of dragging together, you know, wires and components and kind of the schematic that you want, and then you push a couple buttons, it goes off to the service, and then these, these professional printed circuit boards arrive at your doorstep, and then you can go to you know click on a couple other buttons and they'll. And they'll, and, they'll, and they'll attach all the components for you. And so all these things that used to be hard, you know, real industrial manufacturing stuff, has basically been turned into a web service um, in the same way that, you know, that publishing, uh, you know, a, a photo album, which used to be hard, is now, a, you know, just something you can do on on, Shea, on, 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 uh, on Shutterfly or other services like that. You know, you can, you know, manufacturing has become something that is simply a matter of point, click, and enter your credit card number. Now, that's if you want one. So if I want a photo book, uh, you know, I go to my photo site. I've been using Don Shutterfly, a different one, and I, and I get a nice book in the mail and it, it's beautiful and it's unbelievable that that can be, I get a 26 page book for 50 bucks with beautiful glossy photographs. And that was impossible. It's not just, it was hard to do. That would have been impossible to do on my own in any sense of my own 25 years ago. But you're running a factory, so have we, we? Have you? You've now moved away from this customized one at a time thing into mass manufacturing, correct? Exactly. So you start with one at a time or a few at a time. You know that's that's called the prototyping phase. Um, our next phase was we would we would just go to the same services, but we just type in bigger numbers. I'd like a thousand or like five thousand, and you get better pricing. And you know, but the lead times can be a little long. And you know what we discover with that sort of virtual manufacturing process is that it's got um it's got sort of three major disadvantages. Um, number one is um, because the economies of scale really drive you to large large orders. You you know, thousands, you end up with a lot of your capital tied up um, in, in those big batch, those, you know, kind of batch oriented production. Uh, number two, um, if, uh, you know, it, it takes a long time, um, so, you know, it's all, these are often done in China. So you wait, um, you know, weeks, if, if not longer. Uh, number three, if there's a mistake, if you've made a mistake, you are screwed. All that money went, you know, it's just, 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 just you know, wiped away. And fourth, and this is the worst, this is the most pernicious problem, is that now, let's say they're all great and you now have 5,000 of something, you're basically disincentivized to innovate until all 5,000 are sold because you got to, you know, you got to draw down your inventory before you can make a new product. And so it just freezes innovation. So what we learned in step three, you know, we were, step one was prototype. Step two was outsource. Step three was just in time production. And just in time means building your own factory and doing it and shortening your supply chain and doing it yourself in, in small batches so that you can test, modify and innovate you know, uh, you know, as quickly as you'd like. And that we thought that was hard too. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, you know, started on a kitchen table with soldering irons like everybody else. And then my port, my partner, Jordi Munoz, and we may come back to him. Um, he went on eBay and he found something called a pick and place machine, which is basically an elect, uh, electronics manufacturing robot. Um, you know, he found one, used one for $3,000. And he uh, downloaded the instruction manual from Google, and uh, they found a better one. Then we got in contact with the manufacturer, and today we've got like four of them. These are four-headed pick-and-place machines, which are pretty much state-of-the-art. And uh, you know, it's just kind of you know robots as far as the eye can see in these in, in, in these factories. That's a slight exaggeration, but there's a line there's lines of them. And you know, that's you know, yes, our first one cost three thousand, and our and our latest ones cost a hundred thousand. But the fact is that we were able to start even easy to start with a cheap one and build to the point that we're now buying, you know, hundred thousand dollar industrial manufacturing machines pretty much on cash flow, you know, a, a basis just three years after we were on a kitchen table. Now, part of the way that you've gotten your cash flow to be so friendly, meaning that you have enough money coming in that you can buy those machines without 
taking out a huge loan or convincing somebody that you're going to be profitable in the future or giving up an equity we, we, share in the company. We, we actually are, we are, we are profitable now and we do, and we do have a, you know, a loan in the sense we have um, a rotating line of credit from the bank, which is just kind of a normal way of running a business. But part of the way you were able to do that, which you talk about a lot in the book is the role that a social community played, social networking played in designing the product. Correct. So talk about how that, right. the role that plays in, in these types of startups. Yeah, so we're we're one of the you know one of the things that characterizes the maker movement. You know, I've described the maker movement as basically the digitization of tinkering. But there's another element, which is sort of the, that it's it's the web generation, and that it brings with it web culture and web conventions and also web and web, web innovation models. And yeah, I would re, I would reduce those to a, a basic rule, which is that there's a there's presumptive sharing. It defaults you know things default to being shared. You know, if you do something, video it. If you video it, post it on YouTube. If you post it on YouTube, share it. You know that sort of thing, and and that and that simple that simple default of sharing actually ends up creating not only communities, but it ends up avoiding the biggest problem with innovation, which is reinventing the wheel. You know the problem with all those tinkers, you know, and my grandfather and others, you know, from that that era, is that they were working on their own in garages and didn't have an easy way to communicate, and so they're constantly starting from scratch. Um, one of the great things about the web is that there's no point in starting from scratch. You know, a quick search will reveal what the current state of the art is on anything, and you know that's done, and you have access to that, and you know your challenge is to do something above and beyond that to add to add to the corpus of knowledge that's already out there. And as a result, the innovation, which has kind of been parallel wheel spinning for so long, has now become additive and and you know, combinatorial. And you know we build on each other's work. So I think that that that, that web innovation model of instinctively doing things in communities to together uh, together, sharing um, files, and then you know and and, and and operating around open platforms. Um, applied to manufacturing is the is the real game changer for us. It was Arduino um, was the platform we were built on, um, and uh, you know we've now moved on to to other platforms as well. Um, the community we built, DIY Drones, basically serves as a distributed R and D operation. We're an open source company, um, open source software and hardware, um, and what that means is that we put out. You know, basic platforms and you know basic code, and then people scratch their own itch. You know, one of the great things about open open source is that you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, the code is just out there for you to use. And if you want one more feature, rather than having to build you know everything up to that feature and then the feature, you can just tack the feature onto the existing code. And because of the way our license is structured and the way the sort of social compact of our community is, is structured, if you add a feature, you're encouraged to share it. And if it's good and people like it, then we'll integrate it into the into the main code. And now everybody has it. And when you think about that, if, if you have thousands of users, you know, and 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 you know, ten percent of them, um, or even one percent of them, choose to add a feature that was missing. Then you end up with a um, an innovation model that adds features faster than any one set of you know employee engineers could do on their own, or at least not affordably. And the fact that it's all free is is the big difference. Yeah, that that that's a bonus. Um, and of course, a lot of times people want features on their phone, their a computer, their car that I don't want. Um, but some of what you're talking about allows for personalization and customization that would have been unimaginable five, ten years ago. So talk about how this potential for customization and personalization ties in with your work in the long tail. Uh, how those dovetail, if I may use a bad phrase. Yeah, yeah. Well, the long tail, just, just to re- remind people, is the, is there a life beyond the blockbuster? It's, it's what happens, um, especially in the digital world, um, over the last, you know, decade or so, um, as we went from, um, you know, limited distribution, you know, uh, capacity to unlimited distribution capacity. So when, as, as, as music went from being transmitted as a physical object in stores to transmitted as a digital object in databases, there was no, that we, suddenly we had no limits to shelf space. And the economics of distributing something no longer required mass success. There was a, you know, basically it was scale agnostic to use the, uh, you know, the, the, the technical term. But the point is that simply that, you know, that the marketplace had as much room for the niches as it did for the, uh, for the, you know, for the blockbusters. 
um, that created, you know, in, in digital culture, you know, an explosion of creativity and choice. And, you know, and we ha- now have, you know, anything you could want is out there, music, film, games, and, and you know, text and, and beyond. Um, but so that's what digital, that's what digital, you know, did to, to distribution. Um, but physical has always been more constrained in the sense there's real costs associated with physical production. What we're seeing here now is that increasingly objects, physical objects, can take on the characteristics of digital objects. Um, so let me just give you an example. Um, I have a coffee, coffee cup in front of me. Um, right now, if you want to buy that coffee cup, you know, there's, there's, you know, you're probably going to go to Crate and Barrel or whatever, to Ikea, and, and buy it. It was probably mass produced. There's some real costs associated with both its production and its transportation and, and storing. And, you know, all that's, all that's reflected in both the choice and the price of that coffee cup. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out my phone. I'm, I'm, I'm pretending I've got an iPhone in front of me. I've actually got an Android. But um, on, on my iPhone, I'll take out my tablet. Okay, I really do have a tablet. I'll really do this. I'll take out my iPad, and I'll open up a, uh, an application, a free, a free app called 123D Catch. And uh, it comes from Autodesk. And this app is a reality capture app. It's basically a 3D scanner. And I'm going to go click, 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 click around the coffee cup and take a bunch of pictures and then send those pictures up to the cloud and, you know, just pushing a button. And then a couple minutes later, down will come a 3D design. It's basically has been scanned and digitized. And now that, now that thing, now that physical object, those atoms have taken on the characteristics of bits. Now it's a digital object. And now I can upload it to a service. I can, I can distribute it. We can copy it infinite number of times. Now it's really easy to modify. You just bring it into one of those CAD programs we were talking about earlier and I'll make it, I'll make it longer or I'll change the materials made of or I'll put a, put a cool design on it or something like that. And now if I want to re- return it back into atoms, I can do so on my local 3D printer out of plastic, and maybe I don't want to drink coffee out of that one. Um, or I'll send it to Shapeways and be made out of uh, an even better material than it currently is. I want it made out of stainless steel, or I want it made out of, uh, you know, out of titanium. Um, and so now I've basically taken on the ability to to do, you know, when, when Apple released the iPad, the iPod, they had that motto, rip, mix, burn. When rip was to sort of in, in, to take a physical object and make it yours, make it digital, mix was to change it, and then burn was to bring it back to atoms, to put it back out on a on a CD, to burn it out of a CD, to essentially to manufacture your own music um, or modified music. Well, Autodesk with this combi- you know with their combination of, of apps like One Two Three D Catch has a motto called Rip Mod Make. And it's the exact same thing. You digitize an object, you modify it, and then you, and then you, and then you, you fabricate it. You, you make it, make it real again. And those web innovation characteristics, the ability for anybody to, mo- to create their own culture, to modify culture, to personalize culture, um, which was so powerful um, in the digital space over the last 20 years, is extending to physical stuff. Yeah, so, uh, and the cost of it is, is a huge part of that. So the fact that it's, you know, if I said to you again, 10, 20 years ago, let's make a, we've got a coffee cup and it's made out of uh, some ceramic material. I'd like to know what a stainless steel coffee cup would taste like, feel like, hold mm-hmm. like, et cetera. So I'm going to go make one. Well, it would cost you uh, maybe, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of dollars. The, the beauty oh, of at this. at least. I mean, you know, in the old mod, you'd have to get a mold made and yeah. work with pros, and they wouldn't work on scale of one. They'll right. only work on They'd scale of thousands. You. They'd laugh at you. Maybe your uncle would do it for you. But uh, what you're talking about now is done at, at, at reasonable, sometimes a stretch. We, we can talk about the car example in a minute, but uh, it's a fraction of what you might imagine it would be, which allows you to customize if you really like it your way. Yeah. And that's exactly, you know, again, it, 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 one of the risks is that a lot of these examples seem a little trivial, um, you know, coffee cups and, 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 and such, but, you know, but, the, you know, I, I kind of live on both ends of the, of the spectrum. I mean, you know, the reality is that the, the you know, the tools of the maker movement have allowed me to create an aerospace company, which is, you know, proper manufacturing. They've also allowed my children to personalize their dollhouse furniture. And I can't tell you which of those is more important. I think on some sense, probably my children is more important because my children, and any other child who grows up with a 3D printer and CAD tools, um, and I think increasingly that'll be they'll be ubiquitous in schools. Um, you know what they've learned is something perhaps perhaps more important, which is they've learned that they have the power to make stuff. That anything, any idea they have can be made real through a you know relatively simple screen 
screen process, which they're already familiar with, like you know, through video games. I mean, I used to have ideas, but I didn't have any way to make it real because I didn't have machine school skills. I didn't know how to work a metal lathe to say nothing of access to a metal lathe. You know, the fact that you've taken that skill requirement out of the equation and it's simply a matter of, you know, in your word processor, you go to the file menu, you pick print, and something kind of magical happens. You know, bits on your screen are turned into atoms of ink on paper, you know, a complex computation process involving fonts and postscript and, and, and rasters and vectors and all sorts of scaling, you know, happens you don't know, need to know anything about it. All you know is you click that button and out comes, you know, a paper with text on it. To take manufacturing, and if you go to any one of these CAD tools I've just described, rather than print, they have make. And you just click on that button, and it walks you through this little quick wizard, a little bit like a printer dialogue, that walks you through some 2D versus 3D, material selection, strength, weight, cost, considerations. Do you want to do it locally? Do you want to do it in the, in the cloud? And then you, you, you click, 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 and then you press OK. And then, you know, out it comes. And, you know, it's a physical object. All that complexity abstracted away. And so that, I think, in, in, if, if, if anything, the big transformation is that kids, you know, generations can grow up thinking that making stuff is as simple as publishing a blog. And increasingly, it will be. Yeah, that's very cool. By the way, I want to make it clear, your drones, uh, your, your factories that you said you're running an aerospace company, they're not armed. Is that correct? In not all aerospace companies make weapons. You know, ours are not armed. Ours are small, and uh, they weigh uh, less than four pounds. They tend to be about sort of three feet in size. They're uh, they're all de- they carry cameras. They're designed for things like um, like Hollywood, agriculture, search and rescue, things like that. A lot of action sports they get used for that. Um, they are they cost like like six hundred dollars, not six million dollars, and um, they are uh, you know very much designed for the uh, civilian um, you know, uh, uh, drone market, which is just now emerging. Uh, we, we very explicitly avoid the military markets. I hear you. Now, you mentioned earlier that your two factories, where are they again? Uh, San Diego and Tijuana. Now, why did you not uh, build – everybody thinks that all the factories in the world are moving to China, but you did not put your factories there. Why? And I, I know from talking to you that that's something of a trend, that there some manufacturing is – not just still being done here, but some of it's even coming back. Uh, talk about yeah. why you did that. So we started in China. Um, you know, that's where you go to have electronics made. Shenzhen, Guangdong province in particular is, is you know, the, the, you know, where your iPhones are made and, and such. And there's a, really an, an extraordinary um, concentration of, you know, component manufacturers and supply chains out there. Um, so we did start there. Um, what we discovered, you know, very quickly were those three things I described earlier, or four things I described, you know, the, the, you know, the, the cost and delays and inflexibility of a long supply chain. Um, so we wanted to bring it back. Um, so we want to shorten our supply chain. And so mostly we could be more innovative. You know, the most important thing was that we wanted to be able to change the designs every day if necessary. You know, sometimes in big ways, sometimes just changing one component for another one that was easier to source. Um, and, and short supply chains were the only way to do it. Um, time is a killer. You know, the, you know we, money was never a problem for us. Time is the problem. And when you look at the difference between kind of maker movement companies, and I would, when you think of maker movement companies, you may not have, you know, your listeners may not have anything to, to visualize, think of Kickstarter or Etsy or Quirky, or, but Kickstarter in particular, if you've ever bought something from Kickstarter, a physical product, that is really an example of the maker movement industrializing. That's the venture capital arm of the, of the, of the maker movement, if you will, or at least the financing arm. Um, so, you know, so when, when you look at them, what, what is their key differentiator? And it's that they move fast that they can move faster than traditional companies. They just, they're the smaller teams, more nimble, et cetera. But if you have three month delays in your supply chain, that pretty much kills your, kills your speed. So we wanted to move it back. And the question was how, um, I, I mentioned that I started this community, DIY Drones, to kind of share my ignorance and, you know, go on this journey of discovery together. And one of the first people that kind of came on the community was this guy who was uh, flying a helicopter with a Wii controller that he'd hacked and <laughs> added this Arduino um, processing board. And I was pretty impressed. And he posted his code and he posted his YouTube video. And that's kind of essential to prove credibility. And uh, his name was Jordi Munoz. And um, um, I, he seemed to be the smartest guy out there. And he knew everything and, you know, was just kind of discovering new stuff. And he had these kind of animal instincts for where technology was going. Um, so I, I, I got in touch with him. We did some projects together. Came time to start the company, 3D Robotics, so that people could, you know, wouldn't have to just download the files. We could actually sell them the thing pre-made. I decided to, to, to start it with him. And at that point, I said, 
tell me a little something about yourself. And it turned out that when I'd met him, he was a Tijuana teenager. He was a 19 year old graduate from high school in Tijuana and uh, never been to college. And um, today he is, um, you know, he's been the CEO of 3D Robotics uh, and, you know, is now, now the president and has helped build a multi million dollar robotics company. And, you know, what everyone thinks, oh, you know, the editor chief of Wired magazine starts a robotics company with a Tijuana teenager. I'll bet, I'll bet Chris taught Jordy a lot. And, you know, the reality is just the opposite. Um, you know, what, what, what I learned was first the, you know, sort of the, you know, he's, he's a web native. So he taught me a lot of this, you know, the power of open platforms and Arduino and all that. The second was that he was the one who discovered that manufacturing was easy. And he was the one who bought the, you know, the used pick and place machine on eBay and built something. I would go down there you know, down to San Diego and, you know, first time it was in a garage and the next time it was some commercial space. And the next time it's in a big commercial space. And there's like these, there's these like scores of people wearing like our t-shirts who are like, who have like, you know, titles and like roles and responsibilities and are running this manufacturing operation. I was like, how does this happen? And the answer is he just did it. But the third thing, and the most important one, which gets back to your question, is that you may think that he was being a Tijuana teenager was a bug, but in fact it was a huge feature because I, like a lot of Americans, had sort of suffered from the the prejudice that Tijuana was you know drug cartels and cheap tequila, and what he knew is that Tijuana is the Shenzhen of North America, that you know that it's a city twice the size of San Diego with you know the most sophisticated electronics assembly operations in North America. So your flat screen TVs and your 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 your, your Samsungs and Panasonics and Sharps and and, you know, if you've got a if you've got a um, a jawbone up, you know, uh, uh, exercise tracker that was made in Tijuana, and most you know, like a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, medical uh, high tech medical devices are all made down there. And um, so, you know, I would not have had the courage to put a factory in Tijuana. He, as a Tijuana native, realized that not only was it safe and you know high tech um, and cheap, but that those essential manufacturing skills. Um, you know, the engineering skills, you know, the experience of running big factories, which a lot of, which we've lost in the United States are still there in Mexico. In fact, we don't just get cheaper engineers, we get better engineers there. So some might think that um, that bodes well for the future of manufacturing jobs in the United States, or at least in the, uh, this, this uh, side of the Pacific. But as you point out in the book, uh, productivity here, uh, the, the ability to produce a lot with very few people is continues to grow because of the application of robots to the production process. So mm-hmm. the people, as I think as listeners to this program know, and certainly as your book points out, manufacturing is very alive and well in the United States. We're the leading manufacturer of the world. Uh, we just don't employ as many people in it as we used to. And that has political implications and, and human implications for people of certain skill levels. But uh, do you think those jobs are coming back? Those, the factories might, but do you think the jobs are? Yeah, it, not those jobs. You know, the, the the sort of classic factory job from the nineteen you know sixties. Um, you know, that kind of you know union, you know, um, well paid, route to the middle class job. You know, those are probably not coming back. Um, what 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 might come back are the ones that you know we have personal experience in, um, which is um, you know c- call it more of the Silicon Valley model uh, or like the small and medium sized business. You know, so I, I know everyone says that small and medium sized business is the engine of the American economy, but they they don't they forget that most of these small and medium sized businesses are like pizza franchises and dry cleaners and and the other little service businesses. They don't really have global to even national reach. They're they're local service businesses. Um, you know, the Silicon Valley model is small, medium sized businesses that aspire, that are global from start and aspire to be, to be big businesses someday. Um, and I think that, you know, a manufacturing model of entrepreneurship and startups built around that sort of Silicon Valley startup model is, is a more exciting and, but a different view of what manufacturing can be. Um, when you look at those Kickstarters out there, I mean, my favorite, my favorite Kickstarters, everybody's favorite Kickstarters, the, uh, the Pebble smartwatch, you know, four kids in Palo Alto launched a smartwatch on the same day as Sony and they just blew Sony away. Um, because, you know, they were more, they were, they were, you know, and they were aligned with the weave of the web. They were, you know, they were social. They was, it was a better technology. They were moving faster. They marketed better. It was just cooler. And, you know, that, and, and to, and to think that the four kids in, you know, in the old days, four kids in Palo Alto just couldn't compete with Sony because they didn't have access access 
that manufacturing technology. Even if they had the idea, they just couldn't make it. Now they can, and that's what the democratization of manufacturing allows, is that is those, you know, it, it's fun, that fundamentally the ideas and the enterprise become the dominant trait of success rather than simply access to the means of production or ownership of the means of production to use the Marxian phrase. But there's a, there's a cautionary postscript to that story, and I wanted to bring it up uh, later, so we'll, let's talk about it now. Uh, with Kickstarter is this wonderful way that you can raise money without having to uh, sell your soul or your at least ownership of your company. You go to the web, you raise money from people who want to buy your products, so you sort of you get your orders in advance, essentially use those orders to fabricate the item. The, 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 the downside of that in this case is that the Pebble smartwatch was supposed to have launched in September. As far as I can tell, it's not out yet. And the blog hasn't been updated since September or August. And the pressure that investors put on a startup to work 90 hours a week is different when your investors are people who might want to buy your product, you hope. And so it's a different set of incentives, I suspect. Well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll argue with this, with you on this one. I don't know much. Um, I, first I of all, there's not so much to argue about. I'm just making the observation that, that, there are a lot of great products that get delayed in their launch that have nothing to do with the source of their funding. So I don't want to suggest that this is a definitive sure. proof. I, I, but so I tell me the why it's the rate of Kickstarter is much lower than 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 the world of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship as a whole. Um, Pebbles, um, sorry, Pebble, I'm just tripping my my chair here. Pebble's going to be a few months late, um, but even a few months late is still going to be years faster than Sony's development cycle. Um, Pebble, by the way, upload um, their last blog post was six days ago, um, and it I must have been. Had 150, had 156 comments. Good. I was on the dead. Um, I must have been on the dead site. I must have been in the wrong yeah, place. Yeah. Okay. Go to the go to the Kickstarter site itself. That's where the posts are. Um, you know, when I you know, so, so startups are hard. Entrepreneurship is hard. The failure rate is is you know more more than half of them of these companies are expected to die. Um, the, the reality is the Kickstarter model actually has a lower risk factor because of its process. Um, the reason companies die is 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 yeah sure sometimes it's failure to execute, but sometimes it's just a bad idea or, sure. or, or they misjudge the market. The great thing about Kickstarter is that de-risks you know, those two last ones automatically as part of the process. If it's a bad idea, it's not going to hit its funding um, you know, um, uh, threshold. And um, if you've misjudged the market, you're also not going to hit your, your funding threshold and if there is no market. And so those two kind of cradle death you know, you know, um, risks for startups are essentially reduced or de-risked um, by by Kickstarter's, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, let's say market testing um, model of getting people to actually vote with their their wallet. Yeah, no, I agree with before that. Before a product comes into fruition, no, it's an incredible thing, and the and the ability of this kind of funding with social networking to do your market research for you, your focus groups, uh, and do it better than all those things do uh, is really, I think, is very important. Now, yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Kickstarter. I am not, I, would, I, I should say, a fan of the equity-based model of crowdfunding where rather than pre-order a product you're actually investing in a company i'm not saying it's not going to work i'm just it just feels fraught and you know and and the potential for fraud is much higher than it is with kickstarter uh but coming back to the employment issue uh and the the small and medium-sized business issue i interviewed adam davidson uh, a while back uh, and, and you mentioned him also and what we talked about was how uh the jobs, the manufacturing jobs that do stay here in the United States tend, of course, to be highly technological. And he talked about how skilled they are. They're not somebody standing in assembly line like Charlie Chaplin in modern times turning a wrench three times uh, every five seconds. So it's people applying calculus and other things to very, very small tolerances and machining to produce very precise products. Does the web digital revolution that you're talking about in manufacturing threaten the stability of those uh, employment possibilities? It seems to me they will, event- will eventually. 
Yeah, there's always a dislocation um, whenever you bring technology into any workplace. I mean, when I look at we look at our 45 employees, you know, about 10 of them are on the engineering side. Um, another 10 of them are basically operating robots one way or another. But the other, you know, the other, you know, call it, call it 25 are actually doing the same job they always would have been doing. They're, they're um, working in the shipping department. They're working at customer service department. They're on the quality assurance or, or rework side, which is basically they're looking at products by hand. They're fixing them if they're broken. They've got soldering irons in their hand. And they're kind of bent over a desk wearing a smock. Um, so I'd say about half of our jobs are kind of new jobs, kind of very, very white collar, very kind of knowledge worker jobs. And the other half of the jobs are traditional jobs. But the point is, is that we had, you know, we created all 45 of these jobs in North America where they previously would have been in China. So, so you could say that maybe we didn't, uh, we, uh, not all 45 are traditional manufacturing jobs, although half are. But the point is that, that these are new jobs and some of them are paid better than those old manufacturing jobs would have been. I mean, I think that one of the really interesting robots to look at in terms of job creation, uh, replacement, and displacement is the uh, Rethink Robotics um, Baxter, which is um, created by uh, Rodney Brooks, one of the you know one of the gods in the robotics industry. Um, this is a um, it's basically a torso sized robot with two two arms and a kind of a screen for a face. And it comes on a, on, a, on a wheeled pedestal that's pretty much the size of a chair. And it's designed to do sort of, sort of low-skilled hand assembly jobs, like putting cupcakes in boxes. And it, 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 there's something really cool about the fact that it's on a wheeled pedestal because you basically you, you walk up to somebody in a factory who's putting cupcakes in boxes, and you tap them on the shoulder, and you sort of, <laughs> you sort of wheel their chair aside by two feet. You wheel Baxter in exactly their spot at exactly their height, and then you pay them for the next hour to kind of walk behind, to stand behind Baxter, put put their arms around and hold Baxter's arms and show Baxter how to do their job the way you would show a child how to do it. And then Baxter learns by being, by, by doing and then, and then, and then the hour's over and you thank them, you give them the last paycheck and that's, that's the end. And Baxter cost $22,000 all told, yeah. which is like half the price of a, of a, of a worker yeah. per and year you, and you can, when you include all the benefits. And you can keep the factory at a different temperature and you can turn the lights off because Baxter doesn't And Baxter, things, and Baxter, yeah. you know, will run three shifts a day and Baxter's not unionized and Baxter doesn't take breaks and Baxter doesn't have health insurance and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and oh, by the way, and Baxter can learn any job you teach. And remember, so I think that's I think that's cool because I think those are kind of crappy jobs. But then again, it's not me losing my job. So yeah. you know, I have mixed feelings. I guess so, you know, I pull back. Well, you know, it's like um, it's like Easy Pass. Um, it's great that I don't have to I don't have to stop to take the coin out of my pocket. It's great that it, in theory, could be cheap. But um, the people who collect the money at the tolls don't um, have a job anymore or there's fewer of them. And that's called progress usually, but you do have to find something for those folks to do. Or they, excuse me, they have to find something for themselves to do. What usually happens in markets is that new opportunities get created for those people. When you're in a recession like we're in now or a near recession, it's hard to imagine that happening. I think people are very afraid of that kind of progress. Yeah. What, what happened? You, you'll know the answer to this. What happened to the typing pool? Where did they go? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, people used to. Well, my dad, who's who's uh, who's eighty two, uh, st- and I know many people over the age of seventy who this is true for. Uh, he still right. He never got into the habit of using a keyboard. He never was much of a typist, and he still writes what he writes. He writes stories, and he writes them in longhand on yellow pads with a thing called a pencil. And then he has a thing called a secretary, and that person mm. types up his stories for him. And the advantage of the digital world for him is that if he decides to change the story, it's easy. Um, unlike, yeah. unlike the old days, uh, uh, I remember when um, when Gary Becker, my advisor in, in graduate school, wrote a book, and Myrna Hayeki, his uh, secretary, typed it up with you know a zillion equations. And when things went wrong, it's kind of a nightmare. Uh, and then you get a selectric, and that helps. But the digitization is a wonderful thing, even for those folks. But the fact is, is that the people there used to be a lot more people doing that process of converting pencil scribblings into printed words, and um, I think they went and got. Uh, degrees. They went to college. Uh, who they didn't go to college before. A lot of them started going to college and getting different skills, and they became nurses and teachers and um, 
football players. Who knows? They did all the all the things yeah. that they went to Hollywood. They did yeah. all the things that they became graphic designers. All the things that modern the modern job descriptions that have expanded. While things like telephone operators, typing pool typist secretaries, toll booth operators, machine operators, all those jobs are gone and. Yeah. Again, when you're not in a recession, there's those jobs plus more have been created because of population increase. We just get into a very dark mood. Um, and some would argue that the recession is the fact that we can't find those people jobs. There's, there's structural problems. I'm not convinced of that, but it, it may be true. But yeah. uh, in the past, well, it's you know, been, I, I don't, I don't well. have, and I admit this actually in the book, I don't have an answer to America's, you know, um, employment or, you know, um, you know, questions long term. I mean, we definitely do see widening, you know, um, uh, labor inequality in, in that space. And by the way, it's not just true to America. I mean, you know, automation is coming everywhere, even in China. Now, China, China's, uh, you know, is not as controversial because they have a demographic, um, you know, picture that because of the one child policy, they're actually, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very close to their peak population and they're not going to have to create twice as many jobs in the next 10 years. So automation is not, not so risky. But in other countries, um, you know, automation is truly, uh, truly disruptive. Um, it, is, it is great in, you know, for the consumer and that you get better products cheaper. It's great for producers and that you can make better products uh, cheaper. But, you know, at least in terms of the direct production of the, of the, of the, of the goods, it, it, it needs fewer people. And that is, that is, you know, that's the reversal of globalization. It's driven entirely by, you know, by, um, you know, uh, whittling down the labor arbitrage um, calculus, which drove globalization for the first couple hundred years. Um, now, now globalization it goes to, you know, where closer to markets, um, where the, where the political risk is the lowest, where the ideas are the best. Um, but you know, less and less about where the labor is the cheapest. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a great point. Um, let's talk about the scope of this and it's, and it's big potential. If, if it's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of romance in the book and I think it, it just, the, the phenomenon you're talking about deserves a lot of romance. It is potentially and just we're on the cusp of an extraordinary thing. I think most people listening here with children probably don't have a, a MakerBot in their house or a 3D printer. I don't. Um, so my kids have missed the revolution. They'll get it maybe in college or later, but or their kids will. But uh, what's the potential for this beyond just the novelty of it? So uh, we talked about this before, but let's go a little deeper. So for example, in, in the old days – meaning five or six years ago, there was the thought that a bookstore would just be a place where your book would get printed on demand and it would look just as good as a real book. And now I think that vision, there's still some places that actually do that, but basically it comes onto my iPad and it's even better. It's quicker, mm -hmm. it's cheaper. Uh, I can annotate it, look up words, et cetera. And I, I think we've just scratched the surface on what that's going to allow people to do in communicating ideas digitally. I, mean, we've been, I don't think done a very good job at that yet, but it'll get better. But let's say I want a, um, you know, I want a refrigerator with a different, I, I don't want an ice maker. I want the microwave oven on the outside of the refrigerator. I want the kind of customization, say in my car, I, I don't like the way the console looks. I want it, I want it in a different place. I want my uh, air conditioning to have a different set of intensity than the average person. So I want my car to be designed a certain way, built a certain way just in time. In theory, these kind of improvements allow the assembly of a customized feature, set of features like that and to transform not just things like sprinkler heads, sprinkler systems that you talk about in the book or dollhouse furniture, a coffee cup. Those are all nice and I agree with you. I think the the emotional, spiritual, intellectual transformation of individuals into being in control of their own destiny may be more important than having the coffee cup look like what you want. It's a kind of a cool – thing where we used to be outsourcing everything and, and now we'll be able to outsource everything from our own house. Now we'll get to have it in our house and be in control of it. There's something beautiful about that. But what's the potential of the, for this to really transform the physical economy, the big parts yeah. of the economy, the car, the refrigerator, my washing machine, house c construction, what a hospital looks like, et cetera? I think the only, it's a great question. It is the question. If you're trying to move the needle for the, you know, if you're going to, if I'm going to justify the subtitle, you know, the new industrial revolution, I've got to move the needle for the economy as a whole. And, and I think, you know, um, what I, what I have here really more than anything else is historical analogy. Um, and maybe you'll be convinced by it. Maybe you won't, but let's, let's look at 1977. Uh, it's the homebrew computing club. 
you know, a bunch of hobbyist tinkerers messing around here in, here in, in California. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are members of that club. Um, it becomes clear that a, uh, a chip, I think it was the Intel 88, I could be wrong, but a, you know, a chip that is a computer was available for like purchase and you can, anybody could buy it. And they, and they came up with the Apple II. And, um, and it was, and you know, it, and for people who were excited about the very notion of owning their own computer, this was incredibly exciting. And, um, you know, and, and people bought it. And, and if you ask not them very many, what though. it was not for, very, not very many, not, for the rest not of very us, many, it was, not very many. And if you ask them what, what it was for, and remember it started as the Apple II, but there were a whole bunch of others. There was, you know, the uh, Commodore 64 and the Amiga and things like that. If you ask, you know, in the UK, Sinclair and the BBC, Micro. If you'd ask people why why a parent should buy their child a home computer, or why anybody should buy a home computer, I think you know nobody really had a good answer other than you can program it, and you know maybe it was like you can program it in color, <laughs> and and it was it was you know that was considered sufficient at that that time, and it was exciting enough, but it didn't move the needle. And then what happened is that the users, i.e. Not the, not the traditional users of computers, which were big companies and universities and governments, but regular, rather regular people, found what we now know as killer apps. They discovered, they, they invented things like the spreadsheet and, you know, the web and, you know, and video games and email and all that. And, you know, and then, and then, you know, come 1984, when the Macintosh comes out, and, you know, at, at this point, it's now clear what a computer is for and why you might want one. And, and then you could make a much more plausible argument about how it was going to in 1984, change the economy. In 1984, the computer was, was, we knew what it was for, it was for writing 12 page papers sequentially. That's, I had one. And, and you could write a 12 page paper, but if you went to write a 24 page paper, you'd divide it in two. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's come a long so way. The first Macintosh come a long way. Was, was perhaps more more mind blowing in concept than reality, but but still, I mean, I think at that point, at that point, computers were less about programming and more about 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 um, you know a utility. Um, they were they were business tools. You know, the, the IBM PC had been out for some time. It was already in spreadsheet. It was already out. It was taking over in offices, etc. In that case, it was a lot less about you know woohoo, it's a computer, how amazing, and more like you know now I can do something I've dreamed of or do a job more 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 easily. It, it was all about the function. So I think we're right in between those two. Um, what we've seen is that a formerly industrial technology, manufacturing, is now available to everybody. Initially, we're just doing the same things other people did, but maybe a little faster and maybe a little more customized. By the way, I, I'm not a big fan of mass customization I'm, as, a, as an industrial force. I think it's a great cultural force, but I'm not arguing that the book is about mass customization. I think that's more of the sort of the amateur personal side of it. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm hoping for, if the historical analogy plays out is that what will be made tomorrow by this new class of empowered manufacturers is not the same products or slightly modified products, but entirely new classes of products in the same way that, you know, when we got the web, you know, the first thing everyone said is, oh, you can, cost, you can make your own newspaper or, you know, you can have like, you know, your, yeah, we can, we can all read a different newspaper. And, and, you know, it was kind of assumed we would be remixing traditional media. And, it, and, and only later did people realize that, in fact, we'd be creating our own forms of media and that YouTube was not just Hollywood remixed and that blogs were not just newspapers, you know, um, republished, uh, or at least the, the best of them um, weren't. And that Twitter was, and, and, and Facebook were entirely new classes of media. And I, I'm, I'm, my presumption is that, you know, the world changes not when technologies are deployed, but when regular people use those technologies to do something new. And I mean, the power of democratization is in the people, not the technology. And I think what we've done is a necessary first step. We've democratized the tools of production for manufacturing. Um, what the next step is figuring out what this newly empowered class of producers makes that the traditional manufacturers had never thought of. And I think, I think of it as sort of the markets of 10,000. 10,000 is, 10, is like interesting number because it's too small for mass production and it's too large for the individual. You know, the long tail of content, digital content, was all about things that sort of started in the 10,000s, and some of them never got beyond the 10,000s, and some of them never even got to the 10,000s, but some of those 10,000s turned into the next 10 millions, turned to the, you know, to, it ended up influencing digital culture. And, and the question is, what are those markets of 10,000s in physical objects in manufacturing that don't exist because the current supply chains and distribution chains don't have room for them or don't have a place for them or because the people who own those chains never thought of them? And then what will exist as this new class of consumers just does it because they can? Well, I look forward to watching it with you. It's, um, there's something there. 
and you might be uh, you might be absolutely right. It'll be fun. It's going to be fun to see. Indeed. Now, um, can I leave your listeners with a homework assignment? Sure. If you have children, you know, middle school or high school age, um, and you know, and you remember what happened when your parents brought home that home computer and how it changed your life and your family's and your and your siblings' life and all that, you know, think of this as maybe that moment for 3D printers. Um, uh, you can buy, a, a, you know, something like a 3D Systems Cube for $1,200 or a Replicator 2 from MakerBot for about $2,100, about the same price as, a, as that home computer was for your parents. And um, a kid who grows up with a 3D printer in their home is, is a kid who's got a sense of the potential that's uh, greater than the generations that preceded them. And um, I'm doing that with my kids, and I'm just seeing what that can, you know, what, what, it, what it does to a kid to make them think they can make anything. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, and I hope that someday they'll remember that they grew up, they were that generation that grew up with a 3D printer. And I think that the technology is now such easy enough and cheap enough and just sort of reliable enough that it's, uh, I, I now safely recommend that uh, this holiday season, um, if you have kids, consider it. My guest today has been Chris Anderson. Chris, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.